Hello. <laughs> Comrades. Um, <laughs> my name is Devine. And I'm Rekha. Uh, before we get started, I have a few things that I'd like to say. Um, first, uh, well, our talk is going to be a little bit in line with Tracy's talk this morning about getting, uh, getting offline for a little bit. And uh, it just so happened that when Andy asked us to come over, we were uh, at sea and we were reading uh, Caitlin's book, uh, Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. So when I saw uh, her on the lineup, I was very excited. So. <laughs> um, we are not professional speakers. Uh, we usually hide behind our work. So this for us is a, is a first, and making slides like this is a first, and being, having microphones stuck to our face is a first. <laughs> um, we didn't realize uh, how to make a slides show for this properly, so we have 60 slides. Everyone here has seven slides. And <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> so together, we make a game, books, and toys, and uh, like Andy says, said, we live on a sailboat. Uh, in 2016, we left Vancouver and we went down the coast to Mexico and um, to all the way to New Zealand and all the islands in between. And now we sail. We have sailed all the way up to Japan, and we lived uh, on the. We, right now, we live on the coast of Japan uh, on the boat. Uh, as we went, we experienced a long stretch of uh, non-internet activity. And for us, I think since we had been maybe 13 or 12 years old, we had no. Uh, length of time uh, without connectivity, and for instance, between uh, Mexico and Marquesas, we had four weeks without it. So I don't know how long you haven't had internet before, but four weeks is, is very dire. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, we're going to cover some of the things we've uh, learned, uh, but first, uh, so when all of this began, uh, I was working in Shibuya uh, as an application developer, and work and Rekha was working in Shinjuku as an illustrator. Together, sometimes we would make uh, toys, and we would also publish books. But this, brought, this taught us about one aspect of making toys that we liked, was that we would make toys that people could customize, and they could uh, change and uh, play with uh, in that sense. When we made games, uh, it told our story. We made this game called... Oh. Hmm. It, it, we made this game called Okuni, and uh, it was strongly influenced by our life at the time. When we lived in Japan, we had a hard time sometimes communicating, and we, were, we felt like we were lost in a language that uh, we couldn't really quite understand, and Okoni reflected that. It's a game that has no English language in it. We were also in interested in, at the time about food, and that taught us about some of the environmental problems that we are facing today, and how we could address that. And uh, all of this culminated in uh, stumbling on YouTube on people who lived on sailboats, and we thought, this could be a possible option for us, as it aligned with a lot of our values. So, following in the footsteps of our heroes, we got a boat. This is Pino, our home, office, and a spaceship, as I like to say. It's uh, 33 feet long, 11 feet wide. It may not look big, but with the scenery changing outside of our window every day, it feels huge. It's actually the biggest apartment we've ever had. <laughs> Pino's a house with wings. Wherever we are is our neighborhood of the moment. This is us between New Zealand and Fiji. There was no wind that day, so we were just waiting for it to return, just bobbing on the water. Uh, moments like that are actually really, really precious. Like doing nothing and being surrounded by no one, those were our best times at sea. You know, people, when they hear about us living on a sailboat, they often ask us, oh, what is the, the, the strongest storm you've ever had? And, and they're more interested about that. But really, for me, the most interesting part is just the, the, the silence and the, the, the calmness of it all. And that, that's most of the sails that we have are like that. It's just really, really calm and really pleasant. So overall, very, 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 very nice and very fun. Um, when we sail, we don't fight the weather. Like migratory birds, we follow the trade winds and the seasons. Aboard Pino, we have our own work areas. This is where Devine works, where he writes code and music. It's on, actually on the navigation stations where you know, sailors will pull out their paper charts and plan their travels. Um, I work in the center of the boat in the main saloon. Um, it's actually also where we eat, and it's also sometimes where I sleep. So, you know, the use of every, in a small space, the use of every area changes a lot because you need to have that flexibility. Like, we have hidden compartments everywhere, like food is 
everywhere on the boat. Like behind every door, there's like something there. So often we have to be pretty organized because if we want to get to one thing, we have to move. We have to move a thing to get to a thing, and, and uh, yeah. being organized is a good thing. Um, it's your turn. Uh, it's, <laughs> doing talks like this is new as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, to give you some context, when we began, well, we st and now still, we don't have a driving license. Um, we heard of people that were sailing, but personally, we had maybe just a handful of friends who maybe they knew someone that might have been on a sailboat once. Uh, when we started and started this whole thing, we had no experience on a sailboat. We didn't know if we were going to be sick. And uh, so we had the opportunity to do a one-week sail just to make sure that we wouldn't be throwing up all the time. And well, to, I mean, to, to really exemplify this, uh, when we told my father that we were going to do this, he, he basically just asked me, well, he said, but you, you really hate going outside. Like, you, you're, you're, <laughs> do, do you know that sailing is outdoors? <laughs> And, and even to this day, when people ask us, why are we doing this, and, and so on, Andy was very adamant that we would explain why we're doing this. I, I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> we're, we're still trying to figure it out, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had no uh, knowledge about batteries. We, we didn't know they had to be wa watered. And maybe most of you probably don't know that you have to wire batteries, but we learned that too late. It's, it's, we made, I mean, we made a lot of costly mistakes in the beginning, but not wiring your batteries is a big one. Um, we had to uh, learn about yeah. We had to, er to learn about navigation. We had to learn about uh, long distance radio communication. We had to use to learn how to use a sextant, which we didn't because we had our iPhones and our telephones to, to compensate. But just to make sure, we had, for resilience, we had we packed two of all the electronics that we that, that we could think of. Um, and all of this was was kind of neat. It, it, I mean, as an adult, it's really rare that you feel bad at something. I feel like as you specify, like get better at, at your craft, and you kind of forget about the other things, and and being bad at something again felt amazing. Uh, we had to learn about maintenance and plumbing and toilet, especially toilet. We had. <laughs> Toilet's complicated, but when toilet is under the water line, it's even more complicated. Um, we had to learn about fiberglass sealants, filters, and all this kind of stuff that we didn't know about and we didn't really care to know about when we were uh, living on land. Uh, but uh, the more we learned, the more, well, we could uh, kind of like uh, correlate with our work. So in a way, plumbing is kind of like programming and, and vice versa. Um, we, um, uh, yes, uh, sorry. So. For, for instance, uh, this is the, um, how we learned, went about sailing. Every, like, we basically went on YouTube how to sail. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we couldn't afford to pay for classes, but also we were... Um, well, you know that scene in The Matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu? Well, <laughs> well that, 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 see, that seemed ideal. And it's crazy to think that we, have ac we have actually have access to that technology. I mean, a hundred years ago, thinking about going across the ocean on a sailboat, you would have had to be sponsored by a king or something. Like, like we are really privileged to be able to have access to this kind of stuff. Oh, I, I, again, by the way, like if if you want, I mean, the talk kind of like scratches of, over a lot of these little things. If you're in interested in the intricacies of like how we got about uh, paying for all this kind of stuff, it's only come and talk to us because we were not going to get into the details of of some of the more complex things about this. Yeah, we have more than enough to say, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 20, 25 minutes, right, chop, chop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we bought Pinot in Vancouver, Canada. That's where we started our trip. <laughs> yeah, nice place. Uh, we're not from there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're actually French-Canadian from Montreal, so if any of you are here, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, back, back when we started, our plan was to actually stay there and just to live there and to sail a little bit and work a little bit and just spend time in that area. I was like, maybe we can open a floating bakery or something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but the thing is, when you're on a boat, it's hard to not think about the ocean. Like, we kept reading stories, books and films, and we became curious. So, we went. And the first time that we went at sea, we didn't have very ideal conditions. Um, like the first night, the wind died completely. 
uh, we were trapped in fog. We couldn't see past the, uh, the, the front of the boat or the sides. It's very eerie. Uh, there was whales surfacing, like humpback whales surfacing around us, and the sound of that is also kind of not pleasant, and you don't know how close they are, and it's... Yeah, neither of us wanted to be alone like, at night during that time. We were both kind of scared. Anyway, it was very, very nightmarish. And the next day, we had even worse weather. Well, the, the wind came back and, uh, in full force. So we were riding up and down waves, and I remember thinking at the time, like, is this normal? Is this what being on the ocean is like? It's horrible. Like, it, the, the ocean is just, it's not for humans. <laughs> it's just not. So, yeah, not knowing if it was normal, well, we're like, okay, well, for, we'll just turn back, because this is really, really bad. And we went back to Vancouver, and we were feeling sad that we had failed at this thing that we thought would be really great and that we wanted to do. But then we met some, actually, a really nice couple from Alaska who also have a boat. And they told us that, hey, look, we're going to Mexico for margaritas. And we're like, yeah, all right. <laughs> we want margaritas too, so... And uh, we became really good friends, and um, I think just meeting them gave us the courage to uh, try again. So we left together, and we had better weather that time. It was actually really, really awesome. So this is how we got sucked into a four-year adventure. This is actually the, all the, uh, the path that we did, and all the white spots, or the stops that we did. Um, we passed through about 10 countries, um, traveling while working at the same time. <laughs> the longest time that we spent at sea, as uh, Devine said earlier, was 28 days, 28 consecutive days, sleeping three hours at a time, taking turns. Like at night on a sailboat, you don't stop to sleep. To sleep. You don't put the sails down, you just keep going. It was the farthest we'd been from shore, and it was our longest time without internet. And yeah, you know, life without internet, it's pretty okay. It's a forced vacation of sorts. We didn't really open our computers. We used that time to plan for or and brainstorm projects. Or just spending hours just sta staring into the distance and uh, getting excited whenever we'd see anything in the water, whether it be a bird or a fish or just a tiny, tiny thing. And, yeah, I don't know, everything is amazing on the ocean. Uh, we arrived in Japan earlier this year. It was actually our dream to go there, because we, yeah, we used to live there, and our goal was to actually just return there by sail. So I didn't think that that could ever happen. Like, the whole time when we started this, I'm like, this is not, this is, this is, this is not going to happen, it can't happen. And I doubted it the entire way, until we were actually there. And I'm like, yeah, okay, Mount Fuji's there, so I guess we're here. <laughs> Um, it was really like coming back home, and that... I don't know what's going on, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we made it after three and a half years of living off-grid. And this experience really changed our, working living, our work and living habits in ways that we couldn't have foreseen. Like Rika said, uh, we're, the, the boat is probably one of our, our biggest apartments. In Japan, we lived in a very small place, so for us, it wasn't so drastic to migrate on a boat. Um, we had to learn, although, to live without tap water and without a refrigerator, and other things like this, which you kind of think that are necessary for your life, but in the end, actually, I, it's kind of like closing my Facebook account. I didn't notice it was gone. And <laughs> when we stopped using the refrigerator, I mean, we, we lived happily without it. And, um, I guess our, our, our diet of uh, our well, we have a vegan diet, so a lot of our food is dried, and uh, so I think the only thing I was missing is cold beer, and we managed to do without. I mean, temperature, room temperature wine is fine too, so. <laughs> <laughs> we only had to pick a, we could only pick a handful of things to bring with us, and so we did, and we noticed all the junks that we didn't, didn't need. And uh, we started to notice this as a pattern in, in our individual uh, works. So, um, well, which I will cover a little tiny bit later. <laughs> um, uh, I remember at one point we had to. Well, the la so when we bought the boat, they had all these systems that we eventually got rid of. Usually, our our approach to things if is if it breaks, we just not repair it. So. <laughs> Uh, when the water pressure stopped working, we didn't have tap water, and we were like, oh, let's see how long we can... Actually, no, we didn't know how to repair it, so we are just like... 
uh, and the refrigerator, same thing. And, and over time, we were just like, oh, we, couldn't, we, we, we could pay to, we, we could work more to get more money so we can re repair, or, to address that issue, or we could just not and uh, try to live without. And a lot of the situation that we encountered, it turns out it's, it, it's a lot healthier, healthier for both of us to uh, optimize to need less than trying to optimize to make more money. And uh, this lifestyle kind of like forced us into that uh, mindset. Even though we would, we would make some sacrifices for our, all these different things like the refriger refrigeration and so on, one, that, one thing that was very important for us is the independence of travel. So we, even though we don't have that much space, half the boat is taken with our, by our bikes. And this is, this is the line that Priorities. we will not uh, <laughs> cross. <laughs> When came, ta oh, sorry. when came time to shop for our future office, we had a list of demands. Many that professional sailors would argue aren't all that important. Like, we want, we're like, hey, wouldn't it be awesome to have like a black boat with black sails and all that stuff? But <laughs> as it turns out, that stuff is really expensive. <laughs> so we quickly realized we couldn't get that. So we instead focused on getting a boat that is turnkey, which means that it's a boat that is ready for sailing, that we don't need to spend time to doing repairs. Because we're not very manual people. Like, we didn't grow up using a hammer or a, or a drill. Like, I'd never really done stuff like that before. Well, neither of us. We're kind of in the same situation. We're sheltered city kids. So spending time repairing anything was just not an option, at least at first. <laughs> we wanted to focus on learning how to sail, because you want to be able to do that with a boat. And uh, yeah, as it turns out, the sailing part is actually not that hard. It's everything else. Just you'll see why. Because things fail and break on boats all the time. Like a week after we moved in, Devine was talking about toilet problems before. Yeah, a week after we moved in, our toilet failed. So, you know, when you imagine living on a boat, you're, you have fantasies about being at anchor somewhere in a nice bay, and it's really, you're really relaxed. You don't imagine being in a narrow space, like removing stinky piping, like it's just not what I want. <laughs> um, and over time, we developed other problems too, like problems with the engine and with the sails. Because the reality is that boats exist in a very hostile environment. Like that's a mechanical keyboard that developed a bit of a rust over time. A little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, that's the reality, is this electronics just don't last. And which is a big problem for us, considering we depend on electronics to work. So, but knowing nothing, we couldn't really prevent these problems from happening. So we tackled electricity, plumbing, and engine problems as they came. It's not the best route, but it's all we could do. So all this made it not easy to focus on creative projects. We had to make time to solve problems with, with the boat, especially the first year. That's the issue with being the owners and carers of a, of a space. We're on our own drivers, our own janitors, electricians, and plumbers. And it's not, it's not something we can offload to others, because when we're in remote places, we need to, to be able to, to do that ourselves. We need to be self-sufficient. This is the part of the slide where I get to complain about uh, the things that uh, re <laughs> revolves around my, my work, so in development and so on. Um, so, yeah, like uh, actually sailing is easy. You know, there's like four ropes and these so so few things, but uh, trying to uh, maintain projects and push bills and that kind of stuff that gets really complicated. Uh, but luckily, there's a lot of cool people that give us a hand. But um, for instance, uh, the HIO community was really great at uh, making it possible to send builds from our sat phone and so on. So I would like to thank HIO for, for that. Uh, we had this one time when in Tahiti, uh, I, was, I was really frustrated trying to update Xcode, uh, which is like the iOS thing. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, I think the, the updates are 11 gigs each or something. And in, in, in French Polynesia, you buy like these 2.5 gigs data cards. And I was, I was very frustrated. And also, I got bit and dengue fever and so on. But like in, 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 in front of me, despite, uh, I, I noticed someone else was also pissed off. And uh, he was an also, also an iOS developer. And, and, uh, and I, I, was, I was like, oh, what's going on? He's like, oh, man, fuck Xcode and so on. And I was like, all right. <laughs> 
All right, so I was like, okay, so maybe we need to rethink this whole thing. And, and, and it's kind of like when you go abroad and you try to maintain your habits from home, it doesn't really translate too well. Well, in that case, this was not possible anymore for us to maintain. And so uh, to give you an example, usually we use uh, our, iPhone, our, our iPhone to navigate uh, between islands. We don't have a chart plotter. It takes too much battery, so we figure we'll just use our phone and, with navigation software. And, uh, but we started meeting other sailors who, who would, I mean, they heard that they were programmers on a sailboat, so they always came to us to fix their computers. <laughs> and and uh, one, well, a lot of time they would show us their phone, and it, it, it looked like this. And uh, I, our phone didn't do that, but I, I noticed I, I, after searching a little bit, what, it, what happens is that the phone is waiting, like, won't let you turn it on again until it goes online. And so that, that was scary. So, so my, my thinking after that was like, OK, we need to rethink not only the, the, the type of work that we do, but also the tools that we, start, that we use. And I mean, this is just like one facet of the thing. But with Adobe, you, I mean, <laughs> subscription-based stuff, huh? <laughs> So working from a boat offers different challenges, like our productivity depends on the wind and on the sun. Pino has, as you can see, it has solar panels on deck that we use to power everything aboard, including our computers. We don't have that many because we don't have too much space. And uh, so that means that the sun dictates our work hours. On cloudy days, sometimes we just can't power our laptops or we find our use limited. For the first time ever, we had limited resources to work with, which is not something we were really used to. When you're living on land, you have infinite, seemingly infinite power, really, so you don't have to think about that stuff. But we had to plan our projects uh, during the sunniest moments of the day, you know, and stop working at 4, 4 o'clock because the sun is too low. We started to be more aware of our power usage, but water usage as well, because it's all stuff that we need to provide for ourselves. It's nice to be aware of that. It forces us to be more um, careful. The wind affects us in other ways, because if the wind changes from an unfavorable direction, we have to move, because we want our house to be in a protected place. Like in Mexico, we're moving around every three to four days. And moving requires planning. It requires research, because we need to figure out where we're going to go. And it requires time, because we have to make time to actually get there. So it was kind of, sometimes were pretty hard for us because, it, well, it's a source of stress because you always need to be kind of looking every day, oh, what the, what, what, the weather, what the weather's like today, and is it bad, is it good? And yeah, it's just, it, it, it was exhausting, it, especially, um, well, I, I mentioned Mexico because the wind was just clocking around and we're at times where we're uh, in places where the, the waves would, come at us like unhindered and like we don't want that it's just it's, it's not comfortable um, we have to go on land for internet most times once in a while we can get a signal from the land to the boat like on Uahine, an island in French Polynesia we're anchored in a bay with uh, a hotel Wi-Fi nearby <laughs> really nice not to have to go to bring your laptop to shore it's actually pretty nice to just stay in your home and be comfortable and um, we, we had good connectivity if we were close to land, but sometimes the wind would push us kind of far away from that, which was mean like close to land, five bars, wind facing the other way, two bars. So we had to wait for the wind to push us back towards land to like upload some content, which is kind of a new thing for us. Temperature is another concern. <laughs> Because when it's really hot, you know, iPhones do shut down. And it's the same thing, like, in, if you've been in Montreal in the winter, that happens too, actually. Like, at minus uh, 35, your iPhone is not going to stay open. Wait, look, there's... there's... <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would be distracting. <laughs> <laughs> the cat was warm. So distracting. So, yeah, when it's hot, our phones, our phones shut down, but our bodies, they shut down too. 
we lose our will to work, we become liquid humans with illusions of productivity. So for the past three years, we broke a lot of stuff, we learned a lot of hard lessons, especially about our tools. So uh, one thing that we did is optimize the device that we use. So um, instead of uh, running, relying on our laptops, and sometimes at night we want to watch movies because that's, we heard that was really cool. So <laughs> we, we and so Raspberry Pi was a good option for us to, uh, to do that. It uses very little power and it runs even when the sun is over. Not that it would allow us to work after hours, it's just so we can play Final Fantasy Tactics, you know, after five o'clock. <laughs> but all these electronics, we keep them in boxes, so at the end of the day, we just have to go put them back in, in boxes, otherwise it looks like my keyboard that we saw earlier. Uh, this is Rekka's writing station. Uh, it's also, ras also Raspberry Pi with a s small screen. This runs forever almost on our, uh, the, the, the sort of like a battery that we use to charge our, our cell phones. But in general, I mean, this is kind of cheating. When the sun sets, we just read or do other things. Uh, we lived in places where it's important. I mean, I mean, most places there's no Amazon and then AliExpress or any of that stuff. So we have to rely on being able to repair, or repair the things ourselves, and that's been really, really interesting. Um, that that is one thing that uh, un like revealed to us a, a world of uh, of a rotten corporate uh, interest and. Um, <laughs> Uh, a lot of devices are not designed to be repaired, and that is the scary thing for us. That's one thing that we're, I mean, at this point, we're trying to, to fight against. Um, and the, the, the laptops, like, they're gradually, gra gradually being more glued together, the phone's the same, and making it harder for, for people like us to repair them. And if it fails at sea, well, you're stuck with a with device that you can't repair yourself, which you've bought, which is scary. This is just a cool thing that we found. It's a, it's a, it's a Raspberry Pi running Pi Hole and it's essential for our boat. Um, it's, what it does is it, it blocks ads coming inside the network for all devices connected to the, the Wi-Fi network, so that means that you, the, the, the ads don't even get to your computer, and it saves cycles. So a lot of the things that we do, have to, we, we usually th throttle our processors, so we make sure that the computer runs as slowly as possible, as so to save energy, which is the opposite of where things are going. So this whole thing was a lifestyle experiment of sorts. It forced us to rethink how we live and uh, of what's important to us, like reusing and repairing instead of buying, choosing quality over disposability. Our goal is still to, con to continue to create stuff, but to do it while um, trying to reduce our impact on the planet. We own less, want less, which translates into working less. Well, spending less and working less. Artists like us too often succumb to the lure of the cult of productivity. We feel like we always have to produce more and more. There's nothing wrong with being productive, but the problem occurs when our happiness is determined by it. Traveling around, it made us more adaptable. Being in different countries, we, were, we had different ingredients and materials to work with. So we had to make it work with what was there. Trying to eat like we did in Canada was costly to the environment. Like in the Pacific Islands, it's kind of funny to, to think that it was the only time where we could eat bananas sustainably. Like not having exactly what we needed helped us to learn about new stuff. Like I said, new ingredients. Uh, the video's kind of done. That's like a taro root, which is really awesome. And they showed us how to prepare it, and it was really, really great. And yeah, it helps us to be more creative because we learn how to do things in a new way. This lifestyle reconciled us with nature too. As we said before, we didn't really go outside before, so we kind of uh, we realized it was really, really important. <laughs> and you know, things that used to scare us, like sailing at night, it became our new favorite thing. Like when the moon is gone, you can see the stars. Living on a boat made us stop experiencing the world through simulations. To, s to go and see things for ourselves, not through screens. It made us live in the moment. As someone with a tendency to worry about the future, like I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the worrier of us two, like having the mind space to, to, to just be there was really amazing. I was able to silence that voice in my head and to just enjoy what was around me. It advised the work that we did. So in times when we couldn't make games and we couldn't make uh, 
processor-intensive project, we just started to write books. And this is one of them. We, when, we, when our software programs and tools start to fail on us, we build our own. So this is my illustrator. Um, we were inspired by uh, some of the, the, lessons, the tenets of, uh, the, of development. So like, for instance, I was inspired by three things in the Linux <laughs> development to apply on sailboat and, 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 and travel. And these three things are to write simple modular parts connected with clean interfaces. Uh, when a program must fail, it must fail as noisily and as soon as possible. Designed for the future because it will be there sooner than you think. All these three things, it was interesting that I could take these, these lessons and use them across other disciplines, like sailing. Um, a lot of the things that we know now, we've, we've learned from YouTube and from blogs and from people who write open source softwares and, and, and other knowledge sailors, bases. Other sailors too. Other sailors. Uh, I mean, the, the, the sailing community is basically uh, is super healthy because everyone is willing to share their, their trade secrets, which uh, makes it uh, very easy for anyone to jump in and kind of like hack their way to uh, being able to undock and travel. Uh, and in return, we start to do that the same. So everything that we release now is open source. Everything that we learn, we keep in a knowledge base to make it uh, available to others to learn from. And especially, I think we might be like uh, in the, I'm in the, I don't know, like the, the new wave of nerds on sailboats. So the way we write usually targets uh, other like independent artists and people who are just fed up with living in the city. Uh, yeah, that's just the four apps that we built uh, have avatars now, which is kind of cool. I could not put the slide in. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do the last one? Do you want to close? You're, you're a better speaker than me. I'm sorry. I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, XOXO, for having us. And uh, we would like to thank our Patreon who made this possible. Uh, it's we, have, we are in the unique position of being able to live off of open source, and I know right now it's, it's very, very hard. And I don't, we, ha we don't have a solution, and it doesn't scale. But hopefully, I mean, what we've shown today, you can apply in other fields and use, use that as a stepping stone to do other great things. And in return, maybe you'll inspire us as well. So thank you for coming and listening. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.